Hey everyone, I'm Chef Dennis and welcome to Around the Kitchen Table with me and my co-host Susan Sarah. And Hi. Susan's with us in New York. How are you doing, Susan? I'm just great. I'm just terrific. And you, you're in your maroons, your yeah. maroon jacket. You look great. My plum, I know, I love it. Plum. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, things are great in Orlando. It, it is summer. You know, we've talked about it getting hot and it's finally kind of gotten there, but it was it's been 95, 96 the past few days. Uh, uh huh. A little cooler today. It's only like 93, I think. So. Oh, jeez. Wow. I I do feel sorry for you. I really do. How was your weekend? Any good? Any good food? Any good times? Was it a good we weekend? Do? Um. I know. I can never remember mine either. It, it's hard because almost every day is a weekend for me right now since I don't work. So I kind of lose track. Wow. You know, if, if I didn't get a paper on Sunday, I don't know if I'd know for sure it was Sunday morning. Oh man, you know, you're going to have a lot of enemies with that one, that's yeah, for sure. But People I got, are slaving away listening to you. Yeah, we didn't do a whole lot this week. I mean, we went out to eat one night with some friends and actually had a coffee meeting. I had a coffee meeting at a really cool place in Orlando called Credo. And it was uh -huh. the second time I've been there, and it is a non profit coffee wow. shop. Wow. And the first time I went, you know, I went up and I ordered my coffee drink, you know, my cappuccino. And she goes, okay, I'll bring it to you. And I thought, oh, they're really nice. Brought it to me, never mentioned money. And I said, gee, I wonder if I'm running a tab. And I come to find out, you pay what you want. Oh, my goodness. How nice. They have suggested price ranges. Yeah. Uh, the cappuccino was 3 to $6. So, you know, they have little desserts and stuff. But they have meeting rooms there. They have Wi-Fi. And it really is really a, a cute little place. It's a neat concept. And of course, I end up giving more than it, the cost. You know, the I know. I was going to say, I bet people would do that. Do they have particular charities that they give to? I, you know, I'm not sure. I didn't delve deeper into it. Yeah. I, they, they must. I know I was sitting with someone, and she was telling me that they're also uh, the group that runs it is organizing something to give to uh, give someone a startup. They were, I think she said they were offering $20,000 for someone with a really good idea for a startup business. So I, you know, I don't know if that comes from the outside or if it comes from you know, paying for the coffees, uh, yeah. what they do. But it, it just was really, it's really an innovative, neat place, you know, and it's, it, was, uh, it was nice. It was very comfortable there. Cool, cool. Well, I had a gathering with my family last Sunday. It was my birthday. Yes. And so I had a gathering with my family, and we went to the beach. I said, you know what? I just want to get out of the house, same old house kind of thing. Let's go to the – and we're near beaches, town beaches. So we went to the beach, and what we did was I went uh, – we went and got just a whole bunch of, like, prepared foods but at this like really nice place and it was kind of impromptu uh, because we didn't know about the weather so we got all these things and then we got this super lightweight which we have folding table we found a, sh a tree with shade and we just you know hung around and and set the food up buffet type on the table brought the birthday cake oh my gosh it was just so great and you know what it's so great to have a change of scenery. Yes. So great to, but you know, I'll tell you, but I'll, I'll, which reminds me one step further, what I like to do in the house is to have another place to dine, even other than the, uh, even other, other than the breakfast room or the dining room. So you have a family room, you know, to have a, a change of scenery, I think is so important, even if it's a small table. Yeah. You know, I, I th and you have a nice big family room there. You have a nice big den. You mm -hmm. know, I'm thinking of, of, of having a, a table in your den. What do you think? You know, it, I don't know. We use the two, the two living rooms because we watch different things on TV. Mm -hmm. So there, that was one of the big things when we bought the house was we wanted it to have two living rooms. Uh, just one for me, one for her kind of a thing. But what we did do was I finally went out and we bought a couple chairs for the um, – for this island here. So we've been having lunch on the island and it's simply, you know, like you said, it's so we have a change of scene. We have yeah. something else just to make it a little different. You know, I have my coffee there when I'm not at my desk instead of sitting at, you know, the, the dining room table. 
Yeah, it's just a ch just a change. Change is good. Change is good. So I'm excited about today what you're making. Swordfish is one of my all-time favorites, and we have a lot of it up up here for some. I don't know. Maybe there's a lot of swordfish and. Well, they they do fish a lot in that, in that area. Uh, there are a lot of sword fishing uh, is done off the North Atlantic. Uh, at least when I was, you know, in my in my cooking days, I was always able to get a, a lot of it fresh. Uh, you know, now I, that being said, um, back in the day, like a few years back, quite a few, I had some amazing uh, swordfish from the Hawaiian Islands. Now that was just, it was different. There was pink swordfish. There was just yeah. different varieties. But, you know, after the uh, Japanese accident, I kind of stayed away from any Pacific fish for a while, not sure, you know, how the waters were contaminated. So uh, I'm sure things are cleaning up now. But there were some wonderful swordfish from the Pacific, if you ever have a chance, some great fish in general from the Pacific. Oh, I, I, I wasn't aware of that, uh, which also reminds me about when I went to Seattle um, with Mila. There was, a, I mean, going to the market there, all kinds of fish. But I'm excited to get started with this, and then we're going to talk about how to get those the odors away, and let's get started. Sounds good. Okay, what we're going to do now, now I'm using swordfish, but it could be tuna. It could be any firm fish that you like. And actually, you could use this topping pretty much on any fish. But we're going to, for lack of a better term, we're going to pan roast it, which is really sautéing it. I mean, and we would even go as far as keeping it in this pan and finish it, the cooking process in the pan. Uh, we, we may not do that today, though. But because we're going to be doing, because I only have one frying pan for the induction cooker, so we're going to be using that for everything. Uh, but the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get our compound together, our count, compound butter together. And a lot of times you hear about compound butters, and when you make them by adding different ingredients into it, you are adding flavors to the butter, and usually you roll them up in like parchment, and like a cookie dough kind of a roll and then you slice them in circles and those would be served over steaks, over grilled chicken, uh, over vegetables, you put a slice of an herbed butter on it and it's just... Okay, so, so Chef, can you freeze that? Yes. Perfect. Compound butters can be frozen. Uh, you just, like anything else, you don't want to freeze them too long and you want to make sure they're wrapped well because they, they'll start to freeze or burn and they'll start to pick up. Butter is very susceptible to other flavors and it'll start to pick up some smells and tastes from the freezer. So you just have to be careful with that. But it does freeze well. Uh, I would make smaller amounts of them and try and use them up pretty, because the problem is you forget they're in there. So you want to remember that they're in there. But I have some softened butter here and it should be like pretty mashable, easy to maneuver uh, because we're going to add in our different ingredients. And what I have here is I have some, some uh, really uh, I don't want to say pureed, but very well ground garlic, ginger, and then instead of uh, dried red peppers, they have an herb out there too. I use those tubes that I had used before, those garden fresh tubes. Yes. And yes, I, that... I love them for the simplicity. I mean, I know there's a little something else in it, but you know, I, I just love them for the simplicity. And so those tubes, they have garlic and ginger versions, they have types? Garlic, ginger, lemongrass, chives, basil, Italian. Wow. There, there's a whole wealth of them. But, you know, you have a shelf life on them. So, I mean, I generally use, like, fresh basil, fresh parsley, because I just don't like the look of it as much. But in terms of, like, the roasted, the red pepper, it's, it's really pretty. And the garlic I like because it is more of a real fine chop puree. Now, if I want to see garlic, I'll slice it. But if I want it to blend into something, this is perfect for that. So I, I have the garlic, the ginger and the roasted peppers, and I think I had had a misprint in the recipe. I put peppercorns. There weren't any peppercorns in it, so you have to forgive me for that. And then I have some grated lemon that I'm putting in and some fresh parsley. And really, the parsley is pretty much just for color. I mean, Chef, just give me a loaf of bread and right. let me use that the butter only, now, on yeah, the bread. The only, difference with, the only problem with that is, is the garlic's raw. So it's going to have a strong true heat to it. What you want to do if you're going to do that, if you want to make this like for a compound butter that you're going to put on potato on something and just use it the way it is, you want to roast garlic. So take a whole head of garlic, cut the cut the ends off, you roast it in the oven with some oil, and then you get that real sweet 
Yes, I love that. But let right. me ask you this: can can you put that on on bread and make it a garlic bread? You I mean, could. we're going into another area, but can you do that? Oh, absolutely. You could use Good. this as a, as a coating pretty much on anything. Um, you know, the one thing about this is, is you want to use it more as a finished coating than, than as something that you're going to cook right through. Uh, it'd be like the last five minutes, like if yeah. you were going to boil something under it. That's really, you want it to just get that last bit of cooking into it. So, as you, you know, you can see a little bit that nice. it's got a nice blend of colors. And I'm going to add a little bit of salt to it, too. Sea salt and a little bit of cracked black pepper just for a little additional flavor. Because the you know the roasted pepper, the peppers that are in here, the, there are some heat to it, but it's a little different than black pepper. So I like to always still add a little black pepper to it. All right, so that's it. Now we're going to heat up our pan and we're going to put a little bit of olive oil in it just to saute. And as that gets hot, then I'm going to put my uh, a, uh, whew, swordfish, <laughs> a little salt on the swordfish, a little pepper on the swordfish, and I'm going to just saute them up a little bit. Now, I don't know if you noticed, I was drying them out uh, with paper towels because this was frozen swordfish because they didn't have any fresh in-house. And when fish freezes, it tends to, especially something like swordfish, it gets a lot of moisture to it. So when I'm going to put something in a pan, I don't want it to be all that wet. If this was fresh swordfish, it would have, the, the moisture would be more intact in it. And because of the freezing process, some of the moisture has has kind of seeped from it. So mm -hmm. I don't want now to let, Go ahead. Let, let me ask you a question. Are you looking to get a sear out of that, or is it a more gentle um, saute? Do you want a nice crust? Do you want a real crisp crust on it or no? I'm not really looking for a real crisp cut crust because you're not going to see it. I'm just looking for to push some heat into it uh, so I can get get it partially done. Just get one side really done a little bit more than the other. So we're yeah, we're not going to sear it. I, I don't want it to um, I don't want the swordfish to get that type of a crust to it. You could. Uh, you could caramelize it a little bit more, and, and I was even thinking this might use a little bit of something sweet in it to, to help the caramelization mm -hmm. process, or even something like a, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the sauce, a teriyaki glaze, something along that oh, line. Okay. Yeah, okay. Now, these herbs, nothing is etched in stone here. Okay, I'm getting nice and hot now, and I'm going to put the fish in. And while that's searing, we can talk a little bit. But you know, these herbs, like I was saying, are not etched in stone. They can be changed up. Say, if you don't like ginger, well, leave the ginger out. If you didn't want to have that strong garlic flavor, leave that out. If you want to use something like thyme or of sage or some other flavors that you like, if you want to use um, a different rind, lime or orange zest in it, you can use that. So you, know, you can be creative with it. You can make it a little different. That sounds great. And it looks like the, the pan is, is, you know, the perfect temperature. And, you know, now what about using a cast iron um, pan? Cause that too. That would be fine. Okay. A nonstick? How about nonstick? Would that? If you have nonstick, you know, anything you want to cook them in is fine at this stage. Uh, this is a, you know, well, if you're going to put it in the oven, that's the only other consideration you need to have is that it's going to go into the oven and not damage the pan. Cast iron's wonderful for that. Uh, I might be a little leery about putting nonstick pans in the oven because when you get those too hot, sometimes they give off an odor or a chemical that's not always good for you. So I, I might watch that. That's true. I don't know if you can see, but they're looking really good. Hey, D hey, uh, Chef, we have a question from Coach G. Moore. He says, could you talk about cooking with what grade of olive oil? Sure. Let me grab something to put these in, and I will be right there. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. All right, so this is basically until we 
going. This is all I'm going to do with them. I'm just going to sear them both on either side. This has a very light little crust. I'm going to put a little of this oil oh. on the top. Hmm. All right. I'm going to turn this off. This is going to go in to the side for a minute. So while I'm doing this. So Coach asked about olive oil real quick. Uh, Coach, I only keep one kind of olive oil in the house. I keep extra virgin. And you'll find some people don't like to saute with olive oil because they say it's got a, a low smoke point, which is true. I actually just bought some grapeseed oil to experiment with it. I haven't used it yet. Uh, you can use, I mean, I just pretty much use olive oil for everything because of the health implications. I have uh, whenever I saute, and I've never had any problems. I, you know, I have people tell me, oh, you're going to lose breading, you're going to do this, it's not going to work, it's going to burn. But as long as you're careful, you watch what you're doing, you're okay. But I am going to experiment with a grapeseed because that's got a higher uh, heat point on it and a uh, smoke point. So I'm going to see how that works, and I don't think it's it'll impart any flavor to it either. So that's hey, all consideration. Hey, hey, Chef, you know, I see a lot of recipes using canola oil. Does that also have a high smoke point? Yep, canola is good for that. Vegetable oils will generally have one. It's just seems like olive oil has just a little bit lower um, of a point. You know, just like butter, you can't really use butter because it's got such a low smoke point on it. Uh, and the older, in the old days, we used to mix butter with oil uh, to give it a balance, and we get some of each flavor in it. Uh, but that, that people have moved away from that. You know, you really because you're using butter not in a necessarily good way. Uh, it's not going to add to the flavor. It's not going to do a lot for the dish at that point. It's when at the end of the dish when you want to put the butter in, you want to get that butter flavor, and then you don't need to use as much butter. It's the same thing like I've talked about with good olive oils. It's at the end of the dish that you want to use the really expensive, tasty olive oil when you're going to taste it in the dish. I think that's one of the best tips that you, you go over now and then. It's an excellent reminder. Uh, let's take another question and then I can go into my end, or we can continue here. Uh, Larry Wells says, "Do you pan fry uh, differently? Do you pan fry the fish the fish differently depending if it's fresh versus frozen?" Good question. Uh, you shouldn't have to do it too differently, but with frozen, you have to watch out that sometimes it'll be a little more delicate as it defrosts, as it thaws. The cells have broken down in the freezing process and it tends to um, lose a little bit sometimes with how, how well it stays together. Like uh, I could see just a little piece, a little strand of this swordfish coming out apart a little, and it was from me getting the water out of it. So, you know, that was also part of the case. So you have to approach it a little bit differently. It's like you said, you want this, the fish, if you're going to pan fry anything, you want that fish to be as bone dry as you can get it, before you put it in the oil, because if it's got too much fluid in it, what's going to happen is that oil is going to all come back on you. It's going to spit. You're going to get burned. Uh, you could cause other problems. So that's what you have to watch out for. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So uh, should we continue? Yeah, go ahead. Why don't you do go I... ahead on and show some of your things? And what I'm going to do now is this butter mixture that I made. There's a couple ways you could do it. We could put it right on the fish and we could let it cook on the fish because it, uh, it's only going to take, that fish is, is halfway uh, and it's not going to take that long and it would like cook into it or what, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put it in the saute pan where I saute the stuff up and I am just going to uh, let it cook a little bit, let the butter cook a little bit, let the garlic cook a little bit, let everything cook just a little on a lower heat and then I'm going to put this, serve it over top of the this, of this seafood, of the salmon, or the uh, swordfish, I'm sorry. Sounds terrific. Sounds yeah. great. Okay, so, you know, the the dish is delectable. The, the fragrance of the fish and of the butter and of the herbs is wonderful. But I'm not sure it's so much so wonderful when you come down for breakfast the next morning, when you have these fish odors. So, uh, you know, it, it's... It, it's a uh, an issue in the best of kitchens if they're not planned correctly um, and there's a few things you can do about it 
So, uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit about ventilation, and I also have a slideshow. You know, when, when we're cooking, the you can consider them once the, the toxins, which are the smoke, moisture, grease, escape from the pan, they really are toxins. And what you want to do is you want to remove them. And the reason you want to remove them is because you, you, don't, you don't need them in your home. You don't want, you want your air as pure as it can be. It will settle on your furnishings and on your cabinetry and you could do the fingernail test and and put your fingernail on your cabinet door and hopefully you don't sometimes you get grease underneath it and that's because it hasn't been taken away so the purpose of a hood is to first of all the shape of a hood the purpose is to capture the toxins so you want an, an effective capturing form or shape or design of the hood. That's number one. Um, and number two, you want it to be effectively removed by the motor, by the blower motor. Uh, you want the blower motor to be a particular, uh, it's called CFM, uh, cubic feet per minute, that it can, the blower can operate and wash those toxins away. And that also is dependent on your ducting, your ducting path, your ducting design, and so professional, a kitchen professional will best, they, a kitchen professional knows how to design your ducting uh, well. If it's not designed well, you're screwed. You can have a beautiful kitchen, a beautiful uh, hood, and it's, it's not going to happen. So it's very important. Um, you may also have seen the microwaves over the um, ranges which m countless millions of American homes have and I would say that's better than nothing and uh, use it you know anytime you can have a hood ducted to the outside it's really the best scenario so let me switch real quick to my um, slideshow and I'll just kind of quickly go through some of these uh, hood designs and just tell you what what we're looking at okay where are we here we go. Okay, I think we're there. Yep. So this one, this is actually a kitchen I designed, and uh, this hood is meant to be very simple, just simple and elegant. And uh, it's you know, hoods can take all kinds of shapes and forms. Now, yeah, I'm gonna go on to the next one. Here's a downdraft. Downdrafts are fine. They will not be as effective as hoods. Uh, this downdraft, downdrafts are extending higher. They're making them taller. They used to extend, oh, maybe eight inches or so. Now they're extending about 13, 15 inches, which is much more effective. Now the next image you'll see uh, when the downdraft is down in place, it's simple uh, stainless plate. So that, that's the beauty of that, up and down, as, as we all know. This is a very cool uh, downdraft, and this is by Gen Air. Gen Air has a brand new downdraft. They also have a brand new recirculating downdraft, which the, I call it the guts of it. The motor or the guts of it is under the uh, cabinet. So that's another way to, to um, circulate to have your ventilation to uh, recirculate. It's better than nothing, but it's not advised. Taking it out of the house is, is best. And here's one in the lights add a cool feature and you know help, help illuminate the area. Um, again, here's the plate down there. Now here's some images I took. Um, sort of a trend now, one of the trends, um, if you can see my mouse here, is to have a hood sort of invisible along with the rest of the cabinetry and this does that. Here's the hood, it's quite invisible. Um, now this, here we go, this, is, this looks like a, a bride's dress, doesn't it? I mean it's really cool, it's very feminine, um, it's pretty awesome. Now this one, this is really, this is a person who's looking up this hood goes flat to the wall and then it comes out with a button or with the remote control when you want to use it. So how cool is that? It can uh, integrate with the surrounding areas. Again, this is a, this is a sample of hood uh, fixtures that you would put in the ceiling uh, or built in, integrated into another type of form, which is very, very popular now.
and this is another sort of uh, look at that where you don't have a hood per se. Another dander for the light. And then how about this one? This is pretty, uh, you know, this is a sculpture. So it's, I'm not so sure how effective it is, quite honestly. I can tell by the shape, but, you know, it looks cool. You have a lot of hoods now that look like lamps. They look like lamps. They're, they're hung up high. Here, this is a Mila display, and we have a couple of uh, different types, and this one is just cool, uh, you know. So, so you, you know, you can certainly be very, very stylish. A hood can be, um, it can be uh, integrated in a very quiet way, or it can be, you know, pretty crazy. This one is very tall, so I think this would be quite effective. Uh, another one, again, you know, tall, effective lighting. Uh, this one is a focal point, so you can certainly have that. Again, we have the here we have the cooktop, and here you see a little bit of a glass uh, cover to give you a little more capture area. Again, we need that capture. Um, cool, cool, cool. This must be recirculating because we don't see a chimney um, to the top, so not so very effective. And here they integrated a look. Here's the cooktop. And the hood is up here, but it's more of a design statement. Um, so, you know, so many ways here. Min major minimalist look, and the hood is underneath. Here, if you look at where my um, my cursor is, you can see one of those previous type of hoods is up here, yet they made it a focal point with sort of a glass, almost a birdcage sort of a look. And now here, I mean, look at this. This is what you want, right, Chef? This is your oh, yeah. kind of... That's me. <laughs> I can see that's you. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean it's look, it's you know, it's elegant, it's royal, it's commanding, it has a presence. This is all you. Totally. And again, sort of a sculptural minimalist view. So lots of here we go. This is very common now. We're having seen two hoods. Seeing two hoods quite a bit. I saw that in Milan. This is that whole industrial vibe mm -hmm. that, that we're having now too. And again, you know, so we're just kind of, I'm just kind of flipping through here. This is a more architectural look where you might paint the top of the hood, um, similar to what you're painting the walls. And so I see Chef is coming out with that. Now here, Chef, you got to look at this one. How cool is this one we have? Oh, wow. You know, I mean, this is just fun. You know, so I hope, I, what I'm hoping to do is to inspire you. And you can even handmade and paint your own surface. So here we go. That's that's the slide. Show. Perfect timing. So tell me what you have here. Okay. Well, I I put I pulled the fish out of the oven. I did put them in for briefly uh, to get a little bit of heat on them, and then I put the butter mixture into the pan and I, I cooked it up a little bit. Let me switch this. And what I did at that point was I cooked the garlic. I cooked uh, the ginger a little bit, and I put the butter on top of the fish, put it back into the oven, and just let it kind of cook into the fish just a little bit. Now these need about another five minutes, but I'm actually pulling them out because we're not going to eat these right away. So I'm going to put them right back in the oven, give them a real hot blast for about five minutes before I serve them. And I'll saute some spinach, maybe make a little risotto to go with them. And can, you, can you bring them up closer to the camera? That it looks like a Gorgeous, gorgeous, oh my goodness, wow, that looks beautiful. Mm -hmm. That looks, now let me ask you a question. What about breadcrumbs? You could top a little breadcrumbs on them if you like. It wouldn't hurt them, it would give it a little bit of a, a, a crunch to it. Um, you know, if you did, I would put them under the broiler at that point and okay. let them really get a little bit crisp to them. Um, you could change the seasonings up. Like I was just thinking now as I did it with the butter, I mean, you could make almost a little bit of a casino topping with a little chopped bacon in it and um, a little oregano instead of the ginger and have it have that little bit of a of, uh, casino taste to it, like Clams Casino. Yeah, yeah, but I think that's nice. You know, but uh, this, this alone is very pretty, uh, but... Think about putting it over something. Like I said, I have some, some baby spinach in there that I'll wilt. You know, and I, you don't want to cook it too long. When I say wilt, it's pretty much you're just going to put it in a little bit of hot oil and toss it a little bit. 
just a wilted, and then put the wilted spinach under it and serve it with some kind of a rice or potato or anything else, any other starch that you like. You know, I really love this part of the show because it gets me, and I think everyone who's watching, ideas of what else, how else they can make their own. Like, I, I'm thinking, I don't know if this would go or not, but I'm thinking roasted, like chopped roasted red peppers. Sure. I'm kind of thinking about that's kind of coming to me. And well, when you when you put a plate together too, you want to think of color components, All right? You don't want the plate. Now this has got some nice color to it alone, just with the the topping that we've got on it. But you want to complement it, especially. I mean, I serve a lot of what I serve on white plates because I want the food to stand out. So you know, I'll think of what colorful item I can put with it. So, like I said, I was going to make a little risotto, so I, I want something else to stand out, so I'm going to go green. The red would work really well, too. You know, we used to just say it was festive. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is festive. So, I mean, I can even see a side of artichokes. Or, oh, yeah. Yeah, I could really see that. I mean, you can, you can nudge the dish mm -hmm. in different ways, more Mediterranean, a little more, more French or more Italian, you know, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could serve this with a nice little um, Parisian-style vegetable, little, some little tiny baby carrots, uh, some Harcourt ferrets, some, uh, you know, you could do all kinds. You could, you know what would go good with this, too, is lentils. Some lentils, uh, if you like lentils mixed in with something, uh, couscous, you know, and anything different that's going to make it stand out a little bit more. And, and you always feel better about what you eat when the side dishes are complementary, colorful, and a little different, right? You know, yeah. it, it just gives you a better feeling. It makes you feel, I mean, you'd go out and you would pay, you know, $30 for, for a dinner, a swordfish, and, the, you know, fresh swordfish, of course, not frozen, but you would pay a lot for it, and you'd get these little sides of uh, gently made vegetables or, or starches and you would marvel at them you know when they were served so you know try and replicate that a little bit at home you know it doesn't have to be five star quality but it, you can try some different starches like I said try couscous try to make risotto it's not difficult you know or, or get a wild rice blend or quinoa or, or, an, or aromath or wheat berries and do something else with that just to change up things uh, a little bit I think that's that's the theme. That's definitely the theme today. And you know, let me just mention um, that the next for the next two weeks, I'll be traveling. Now, I want to know how much you know about Danish food because I'm going to Denmark. That's what I thought. <laughs> Not a whole lot. Now, do you think you'll have an opportunity just to share some Danish food with us instead of? I hope so. I it would it would really be nice if I could work something out on uh, next Monday. I'll be there, so I'm going to try. Um, so I'm going to Denmark, then I'm going to Sweden for overnight because I'm going to see my rug whisperer because I import rugs, and then drum roll, I'm going to Paris for three nights. Oh. Wonderful. Yep. yep. Wonderful. So that will be, and I actually will be in Paris that following Monday. Wow. So who knows? Maybe the Ritz will want to do the Den the Chef and Susan show. You who know, knows? even if you want to just, if you can find a cafe with Wi-Fi and have a, have have a chanson en palm for me, I miss them greatly, uh, and a little apple pastry. And a, a cappuccino, or cafe au lait, not cappuccino, cafe au lait in the afternoon. We could just sit and talk about France. And I am going to to give it a shot for both Mondays. I'm okay. going to really give it a shot. So, good. Well, I, I think that's about it for today. Then, uh, thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it and got some ideas for how to cook. Now, you saw it doesn't take long. One thing I want to mention about this dish too is, say you're having a dinner party. All right, you don't want the house to smell like fish. Okay, well, my wife just came in and looked at me and shook her head because she's. You were talking about ventilation. Well, I don't have the fans on because they're going to be loud during the show. So now I'm going to have to air the house out. But you don't want the house to smell like fish, but you want to serve fish. So you could sear it, do exactly what we did, make that butter up, spread it on top of the fish, wrap it up, and put it in your refrigerator. Now when your guests are, getting, are coming and you're getting ready to serve, heat that oven up to 350, get it nice and hot, pop them in there for 15, 20 minutes, take them out, and it's done. 
All right, so that's you, great. And this will work on chicken too. So if you don't want fish, you can do it with chicken. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that you don't put in a ventilation system. No, oh no, you still need, <laughs> believe me, you need the ventilation. That's a good tip. That's a really yeah. good tip. But I mean, it's just another way to get around and and make dinner more enjoyable, make it quicker. You know, this is something you could prepare the night before and reheat it. And, you know, finish cooking it when you come home the next day if it's just two of you too. So cool. Yeah. That terms. Well, so thank you so much for coming. I hope you enjoyed Around the Kitchen Table. Susan, it's always a pleasure seeing you. And it I sure is. What a wonderful, wonderful dish. Thank you, Chef. And I look forward to seeing you in Denmark next week. Yes, week. good, good, good. Can you say something for us in Danish? Um, yeah, yes, good day. That means That means I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right. Bye-bye, so everybody. All of you, and thanks for coming. Bye-bye. <laughs>